You're watching Bread and Roses, a weekly political social magazine that's broadcast via New Channel TV in English and Persian. Hello everyone, I hope you're okay. I'm Mariam Namazi. And I'm Fadi Bospuya. In this week's program, we'll be discussing how people leave religion. We'll be interviewing Dan Parker of Freedom From Religion Foundation. We also have a wide variety of issues to discuss with you today. Everything from Ramadan fatwas to Pluto to women living under ISIS and also the recent nuclear agreement. Stay with us. Religion has been advanced through violence, genocide and ethnic cleansing. It's not all peace and love. Despite many of the inhuman tenets of religion, however, people, including those who are religious, are much more than the religions they were born into. When the discussion around religion comes up, very often if we look at the question of Islam, for example, you see that people can't seem to make a distinction between religion and those who believe in that religion. So you'll often hear people saying that because Islam is so violent, therefore all Muslims are violent. And that's not true because people live religion in as many ways as there are people. And very often they're, they're bigger and better than the tenets of their given religion. Absolutely. And we've always said that um, people's life, actually reality of life, it's um, in opposed to the tenets of religion and dogmas of religion. And people live their lives despite the religion that supposedly they belong to. And that's very important to recognize. And all the time, people in the reality of life come and actually in opposition to religion and constantly experience. And that's why there's a tendency to re leave religion but the, in, in the infrastructure, industry of religion keeps them back. Mm. And also, I mean, the reality is that, uh, you know, we talk about it in, in the background briefing, that people are born based on their geography, and Dan Barker mentions this in his uh, interview as well. Based on where you're born, that's what religion you're born into. You really don't have much of a choice of it. And so it's important to see the difference, distinctions between people and the geography that they, they're born in. And that, that's one of the cruelty of the institution of uh, religion. Um, and you, you see that if, if you're born in Europe, you're most likely to be Christian. Or if you're born in Middle East, you're most likely to be labeled as, as Muslim. But the key thing is that people experience always this drive. That is this in, um, a drive to leave religion. And I think people don't recognize this enough. They think people are religious. No, there's always, when you grow up, every person who grows up, there's this drive that constantly you question and you want to leave your religion. Um, but and even that's, even that, if you don't want to leave it, I mean, um, for a lot of people, you know, religion is not as important. Even in countries like in the Middle East and North Africa where it's shoved down people's throats, it's not as important. It's, it's something you know, very, a very side issue very often. And if it wasn't imposed in many ways, it would be a non-issue, like it is for many people living here in Europe. Uh, absolutely, but at the same time, is that when, when the institution try to force it down people's throat, you'll see people sort of aversion to, to this and try to distance themselves uh, from the institutions. And that's why it's important to recognize that drive to, to move away from religion. But at the same time, we know we have to distinguish, as you, uh, as we said, we've always said uh, before, from the institution and industry of religion and people's individual experience. And that's very important. Yeah, I mean, let's go now and listen to an interview that was done earlier with Dan Barker, who um, heads the Freedom from Religion Foundation. He has some really interesting things to say about religion itself, um, how it's linked and advanced through violence and genocide and ethnic cleansing, and also how people are so much bigger than the religions they were born into. Dan Barker, welcome to our program. Since you're a Christian minister, I guess the first question I want to ask you, is Christianity all love and peace as we hear? I was a Christian minister and I used to preach that and I used to believe that because most Christians are peaceful and loving people. I think most Muslims 
as individuals, most Jews. But the religion itself uses those words peace and love in a totally different way from what we might understand them. When we talk about peace, we think about let's all get along, let's all tolerate each other, and let's just put aside our differences. But in the Bible, from which the three Abrahamic religions stem, peace was not that kind of a word. Peace was not a bottom-up idea of getting along. Peace was a top-down imperialistic concept. So the shalom in the Old Testament that the God of the Bible talked about, the shalom was not this warm fuzzy feeling. Shalom was like the Pax Romana. It was a above imposition upon the people and uh, there are verses in the Bible that talk about that. If you approach a city that God has given you to conquer, offer terms of peace, it says, using the word shalom. But if it doesn't agree to your terms of peace, then you either kill them or turn them into slaves. And then you will have peace on earth, like the Pax Romana. You have peace on earth when you have subjugated all your enemies. So I think it's to their credit that most Bible believers are better than that today. Uh, most Muslims and Jews and Christians are, are smarter and better than their own book. But their own book is not a, a book of peace as you and I would understand it. It's really peace, and even Jesus supported his father's, supposed father's ideas, uh, thought that peace was really a term of violence. It was not a term of, of love and what you and I would call peace. And in a sense, uh, all religions have really expanded through violence, haven't they? Well, yes, of course, the sword. And if you believe the Old Testament Jewish scriptures literally, and of course, they cannot have been true. I mean, they were exaggerated war stories. But if you believe them like I was supposed to, then uh, it was genocidal. It was ethnic cleansing. It was a huge deity who even boasted in his own commandments, my name is jealous. You should have no other gods beside me, no competition. Kind of like a husband who wants to own and control his wife. If you even look at another man, I'm going to burn your eyes out. You know, it was that kind of an attitude. If my chosen people even look at another god or build an image to that god, then they will suffer these horrible consequences. So it's, a, it's an embarrassing book. It was written by these old patriarchal men who probably had their own sexual identity issues and uh, and the control of females, and you read it all through the scripture. Uh, you know, Israel is like a, a prostitute. Israel is like a whore. She's like a wandering woman. They keep comparing the nation to a female, you know, and if she looks at another person, so we need to keep her. We need to, you know, enslave my people into this, you know, this insecurity that your own worth comes from owning your, some, some property. And even in the Ten Commandments you see that. The Tenth Commandment says you should not covet your neighbor's property or cattle or jewels or wife. It doesn't say husband, it just says wife. So there's this huge kind of jealous sexual undertone to this whole religious thing. And I even did a debate, I've done some debates with Muslim scholars seven, seven or eight times. And, and I pointed out to one of the Islamic scholars that I think the whole point of Islam is the control of access to females. That's all it is. It's a patriarchal thing. And the God of the Bible is written by those patriarchal men. And we are stuck with that mindset today. Although most Christians and Jews are smarter than those old ancient teachings. In a sense, it's credit to human beings, isn't it? That even though they are labeled a religion from birth, that they are actually a lot better than the books that they say they belong to. Yes, I think you're right. And I think it's important to point out just how much better we are than those books, which means we have to look at those books to see where we have come. So, you know, we're human beings. I, I was raised in a Christian culture that was pretty much forced on me, like most people are. The single biggest predictor of a person's religion is geography. You know, if you know where somebody's born, you're more likely to guess their religion. So California, Protestant, that was me. And so I thought it was true, and I thought it was, um, you know how you root for your favorite ball team because they're your, well, my religion is my religion. We have some tribal tendencies to, to we are on the inside, and we are the, there's outsiders out there who are different from us. And, uh, but I grew out of it. 
I was a true believer. I was true, strong, you know, knocking on doors and preaching and the end of the world and hellfire and all of that and the devil and demons. And I'm embarrassed <laughs> that I wasn't just going through the motions. I believed it. But if someone like me can think and put it aside and look at it like an outsider and then raise up out of it, then it can happen to other people. What made you question then? I started questioning originally for intellectual reasons. I know some atheists who came out of religion for other reasons, perhaps moral reasons or social reasons perhaps, uh, but for me it was intellectual. I wanted to know if it was true. The motivation that drove me into the ministry is the same motivation that drove me out. I wanted to know what is true. And so it was things like, were Adam and Eve real people, you know? Uh, what is the Bible reliable? Is it really a good source of truth? And then later, after the intellectual questions, then I had the moral questions. Well, is this even a good moral book? You know, whether it's true or not. Sometimes you can have a useful fiction. That's what you call a, a fable or a, you know, a metaphor. It can be a useful fiction. But then I, after I decided that it was a fiction, I also decided it was not even useful morally. Is that why you have been advocating secularism and working towards it for so long? Well, yes, uh, I think you agree with me that there's very little that's more precious than the freedom to think your own thoughts. From bottom up, we think our own thoughts, not from the top down. And if the government gets involved in thought control, then we don't have that freedom. So. Our organization fights primarily for that, the First Amendment of our Constitution, which guarantees religious freedom, which means the government is neither for nor against. The government has to be neutral. The government folds its arms and says, you talk among yourselves. And I don't think there's anything more important than working for that principle of freedom of conscience in the world. Thank you very much. Channel 4 in Britain has done a documentary, a dispatches documentary called Escape from ISIS. And it talks about the situation of women in particular under ISIS territory, an area that is bigger than Great Britain, and there are 4 million women living in its control. And this is sort of amazing documentary. It unfolds the, the hor horrific sort of situation of women living um, under ISIS control, a, bi a bunch of psychopathic sort of criminals, really. That's what they are. Um, and I think when, when you hear the stories of young girls who escape, you'll see how horrible it is for women who are living under in this situation. Yeah, and uh, the, the story actually, uh, it interviews some of the Yazidi women in particular who've been raped. 80% uh, at least have been gang raped. Girls as young as nine years old are being raped and they've got never before seen footage from ISIS, you know, selling and buying women uh, to, um, you know, women being helped to escape from the territories. And I think that, you know, everybody's got to see, compare this to Boko Haram, how rightly the world, everybody across, uh, across the world was outraged when uh, young girls were taken away from school. Now we've t we're talking about, in one instant, 30,000 young women and, and young children actually 3, been 3,000 yeah. been taken away. And how many million of women are under the ISIS sort of control? They've all effectively been abducted against the will. They're living in that situation against the will. And the world needs to sort of react. And I think this program, it's such an important piece of documentary that the board needs to sort of Yeah, I think see. everybody should Every see it. And it's, it's both, you know, both shows the barbarity of ISIS, but it also uh, really shows un unspeakable human courage, you know, people saving girls and women from ISIS. We talked about it last time in our Good News section. Um, and also, um, you know, just women's own resistance and bravery, really. It's, it's, it's really heartwarming and at the same time heartbreaking. Yeah, I, I agree. And I think that's what we need to sort of encourage everybody to see this program and respond. We need the world to respond to this situation. I think we can't allow this to continue no, for any 
anymore. I think we, we need to respond. Definitely we need to respond and also I think we need to really hail all of those people from within uh, Raqqa, within uh, ISIS territory that are sending out information, that are trying to help people escape. Honestly, big salutes to them and we need to follow them more and support them unequivocally. Now, since Ramadan is over, we thought, let's remind you of some of the Ramadan fatwas because you can never remember them, um, you know, you, you must always remember them. And it's good for you to brush up on them for next year because you're going to need them again. And there's lots of really interesting things like, you know, for example, if you're on a crowded bus and you manage to touch someone of the opposite sex, you know, what, what's going to happen? Don't worry, your fast will not be cancelled. Yeah, they're more interested in keeping the you know, the religious sort of arrangements rather than inconvenience for people because, uh, you know, and, you know um, a religion that inconveniences people for the whole month and I put pressure on them, it, it, they don't actually care. There was one of the fatwas that said if the husband sort of by force uh, has sexual relationship with the wife, don't worry, your, your fast is okay, you, you know, it's it just is... This is what they're talking it's about. It's not concerned about rape, but as long as your yeah. fast is all right. Yeah. And what's interesting, ISIS, because we were talking about that earlier as well, they've, uh, during Ramadan, women are not even allowed to come out at all. Forget the fact that they still need to be veiled and have three face veils and they must be completely covered. They shouldn't even come out in the streets as uh, completely veiled because it will be a provocation for men who are fasting. Absolutely. Every part of this system this group, this system, this religious industry, the, the focus of the atrocity is around women and control of women. Yeah. So, well, you know, um, try and keep these in mind because they are very, very crucial. Don't rub against people on the bus. Don't come out in public if it's Ramadan because you might incite others and if you're a woman. And on and on and on. Scary stuff. You might have uh, heard about Behnam Ibrahim Zadeh. We talked to you about him in previous programs. Now, he's a political prisoner in Iran. He was a labor rights activist. He is a labor rights activist. And he's been in prison already for five years. And he's been re-sentenced for another additional nine years. And he's just been to hospital because he's had some really serious health problems. But they've sent him back to prison and he was in solitary confinement. Just because he had a dispute with one of the, the prison guards, the leader of the prison guards, who actually recently been uh, arrested for drug smuggling into the prison. And these are sort of a criminal group of people who control people. And this man shouldn't be in prison. You know, he's a labor right activist, like any trade unions who actually in Europe, in America, for the basic uh, activity, imagine that they're actually uh, banged up in prison for, for no reason. For, and now it will be like a 14-year sentence. And the sad thing about his case especially is that he has a child that has leukemia, who um, has, uh, doesn't get to spend any time with his dad. And especially in Iran, a lot of political prisoners don't get visitation rights. They don't get um, a lot of the medical care and leave that you would find in better quality prisons. Not that I think, you know, any prison can be very good quality. But in general, I think especially with political prisoners, one, the injustice of the fact that he's there and two, the fact that he can't even be with his child. No, absolutely. And we are calling on every human rights organization, trade unions, to raise this man's case and, and uh, protest against the fact that he's in prison and he should be released immediately. There is no reason for a labor right activist to be in prison under this, this circumstance, or under any circumstances. Yeah, definitely. And I think the thing about his case too is that, you know, he's one of those brave people that have written open letters, criticized the government, called for better conditions, uh, even whilst he was in prison. And I think it is important hugely important to support uh, people like him um, because he represents so many others in, in dire situation in the prisons of the Iranian regime. Now, as you all know, um, there's been a lot of celebrations in the streets of Iran because the Iranian regime has 
reached a nuclear agreement with the five plus one. And of course, people are happy. Uh, you know, I think a lot of our family members who live in Iran are very happy because people do feel that it's, you know, possibly a little breathing space will open up for them. There'll be less sanctions, there'll be less pressure on them. They'll be able to travel possibly, they'll be able to get medicines that they haven't been able to get and so on and so forth. And, and rightly so, they should be happy. But I, I agree, I think there's this, but we have to be careful here. First of all, I think there's a limit of underlying happiness because people recognize that the Islamic regime was always gone her about nuclear sort of program they succumb to the pressure. They've actually retreated. They've actually lost uh, this, this sort of this issue, standoff with the um, European countries. So that's the underlying sort of feeling of people. Of, that's why they want to go on the street to celebrate this. The other thing is that we know for the, is a fact that this is not going to change anything. I think that, that's the thing we need to recognize. I, don't, I mean, look at the human rights situation. All the European countries have been very, very quiet. And that's a bit dangerous. I mean, I think the reality is when you are dealing with the theocracy, it's a dictatorship, you yes. know. And I think people need to recognize that, that, uh, you know, these sort of agreements and wheelings and dealings, you know, you've got a lot of Western governments working very closely and with very good links with, for example, the Saudi regime. That doesn't really have a positive impact on the lives of people in those countries. And I think that is the sad reality. But on the other hand, you know, given the fact that this is a defeat for the regime, you know, a defeat that they, we, you know, they never said they would ever agree to, it does open up some space for people to be able to breathe a little more. And when people can breathe a little more, you always have protests following very closely behind. And I, I agree. And I think what we need to keep the pressure on issue of human rights that cannot be for forgotten, the right of people to relieve re religion, the right of political prisoners, the right to freedom of expression, and again, it's a religious government in Iran, and we can't rely on the European Union to five plus one to, um, to achieve that for Iranian people. So people who actually been campaigning for that, we need to continue and we, can, we will not allow this issue to disappear. Definitely, uh, definitely. I mean, if you recall, in the last week's program, we talked about the mother of a young man, Saeed, who has disappeared for the past 16 years uh, since the July 1999 student protests. And, you know, she said publicly, well, you're talking to the entire world. That's what she told the regime. Now tell me where my son is. And I think, you know, this is something that a lot of people have questions on. And we need to keep fighting for people's rights in Iran. You know, it doesn't, the, you know, human rights are, is not going to be solved. It, it won't be solved in the lifetime of an Islamic regime. And so we have to remember to keep that pressure on. Now, the great news this week is, of course, that we have seen Pluto up close. And it's a voyage that's taken nine years for the uh, rover to get there to take these photos. And uh, it's been, it's three billion miles distance. And it's just, you know, one of those wonderful, you know, you feel, you hear all this horrible news. And then to hear something that is just like the height of human achievement. And, and you know, the joy on the face of the scientists. You don't see many scientists happy these days. <laughs> But you'll see that, you know, they, you know the, the fact that they are so happy, you know, they've been waiting for such a long time, all the human achievement in industry work together to go on the edges of solar system and, and, and see up close, you see photographs of Pluto, well, increasing number of moons, because it originally was two and then increased. And, and I think this is brilliant news for everybody, achievement, and, and they are talking about whether they, there might be some sort of um, chemicals and gases that hopefully will have some sort of life on it. You don't know, in my lifetime, we may be able to land there. But let's sort out <laughs> Earth first, shall we? So. <laughs> yeah, well, I mean, uh, the thing is that when you think of the, um, you know, the, the photographs that are being taken are taken by something that's the size of a piano yeah. and that it's managed to travel this far, you know, it's, it's really, I think, you know, that's the beauty of science. It's not as certain as religion is because religion gives people a certain certainty, even if it's all false. But the thing about science is that really it pushes pushes boundaries and takes us to places that honestly, even maybe 10, 20 years ago, we wouldn't believe we could achieve, uh, you know, and be in such a situation. And we are there yes, today. Yes, it was a planet. It became a dwarf planet. Now the, the discussion is whether 
it should be reclassified as a planet. Yeah, I mean, I, I definitely think it should be classified as a planet. It was a planet when I was going to school, which was quite a while now. It's going to stay planet. And I think, yeah, Bread and Roses is all for Pluto being a planet, for sure. The question this week is about Islam and terrorism. And one of the things that someone on Twitter asked me was with regards Islamists who say that they are opposed to terrorism and therefore they're the good guys versus, you know, the, the Islamists that are pro-terrorism. Oh, these are, the, these are shades of different things because Islamism, the non-violent, constantly generates the violent element. You know, we, and we need to be able sort of to recognize. We can't just start slicing these different shades of Islamist movement. There are one movement, a different section, the different departments. You can't separate the propaganda, the media, the bureaucracy, the recruitment arm from the actually people who are armed and fighting on, on the ground. So I, I don't think we should, we should separate them. I think there's an issue, it shows the pressure of the protest movement. Mm, definitely, that, that there are Islamists that want to uh, move away from the terrorism and say that they don't support it. But I also think a lot of this is a play on world, words and it's double speak really. Because if you ask, for example, if you pin down the Islamist that says they're anti-terrorism, is what do they mean by terrorism? Because for them, they don't think jihad is terrorism. They think jihad is a, a, a legitimate and a righteous fight. And terrorism, if the definition is the killing of innocent civilians, they don't think that the people they're fighting against are innocent. No Israeli citizen is innocent. No British citizen is innocent. No Yazidi is innocent. Do you know what I mean? No, Nobody no, is innocent. Uh, yeah. Exactly. So in that sense, it's really, I think, it's very, I think, unfortunately, there are a lot of, you know, progressives, liberals in Europe and the West who are duped very easily by this sort of double-speak. And I think Islamists recognize this. They play. In Europe, they say, no, 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 we, we are for all peace and love and, you know, and, um, and democratic systems of elections. But in reality, the part and parcel of the same machinery, the different departments of the same machine. Yeah, I think it is important for people to realize that the soft Islamists are also very much, you know, if you look two steps away from them, there is something, that their hands are somewhere in violence, you know, and I think it is important to see that. Um, uh, you know, so I, I guess, you know, the advice would be don't get duped so easily, you know. I think for us, I don't know, I think we have this sort of innate, you know, we can smell an Islamist a mile away just because we just know them so well. And it always surprises me how very good people, humanists, secularists, uh, you know, people who are atheists, uh, people who are free thinkers, get duped by, you know, some Islamists uh, because they just seem to speak a little softer. Whereas, in fact, you know, they're all one and the same. They all want theocracy. And, and the other thing to remember is that you know, Sharia law, for example, the Khalifa, these are all forms of terrorism against the population at large. Uh, yeah, I think it's important to recognize the reason for generation of this idea also is government relationship. We'll see that there is an interest within governments to carry on and separate the violent from non-violent, but deal with it. You know, they're okay to deal with Saudi Arabia, but they don't want to deal with Daesh or but, Daesh. And, yeah. and isn't Saudi Arabia and violence? This is, is the same I mean, thing. Yeah. And, and you, so we need you know, to recognize yeah, that so. the part and parcel of the same sort of machinery. Yeah, I think so. So, you know, I think I, I really advise that people think a bit more before they come and take a position in favor of Islamists because they happen to say something ridiculously absurd to dupe you. Um, anyway. That brings us to the end of the program for this does, week. It does, it does. I hope you enjoyed this week's program. We are going to tape one more program and then we're going to have a whole month off in August because we're going to party. So send us your suggestions and we hope to have a really good, wonderful, fresh program for you in September. But we still got one more until we do go off air for a month. And up to, uh, uh, until next week from me and Maya Namazi, goodbye. Bye. Hi, I'm Mariam Namazi. And I'm Fadi Bospuya. 
We're hosting a program called Bread and Roses. It's a weekly program that's broadcast in Persian and English in the Middle East and North Africa, primarily Iran as well. And it's also shown on YouTube internationally. And we've been doing this since last May. We're coming up to a year's anniversary and yeah. we, we've had quite a lot of fun making these videos. We discuss taboo breaking, free thinking ideas. The Islamic regime of Iran has called us immoral and corrupt. And that's why the, you need to support us. We are and the vo alternative voice in Middle East and North Africa. Of corruption and immorality. So do support us. Here's a short video from Patreon that explains how you can help us with even just one dollar a week. That's nothing. Support us. Patreon lets fans become patrons of their favorite artists and content creators. It's different than Kickstarter because it's not about one big project that requires lots of funding. It's more for bloggers or YouTubers or webcomics, anyone who creates on a regular basis. Here's how it works. When you become a patron, you're agreeing to give an artist a tip of an amount you set every time they release a piece of content, whether it's a new song, a video, or a recipe. You can set a monthly maximum to make sure that you're always within your budget. Choose an amount, enter your payment information, and you're done. Becoming a patron allows you to view and post in the artist's stream, and in exchange for your support, artists offer additional patron packages, which might include monthly Google Hangouts, music production tutorials, pre-sale concert tickets, or anything they can offer as a way to say thanks. Patreon, empowering a new generation of content creators. Thank you.